a recurring theme that um, we, we visited um, over the last six years while I've been on this board is this perception of a lack of coordination between the two governmental entities. Um, I believe you indicated that you surveyed four existing industries. Is that correct? That is correct. So my question is two-prong. First, do you think that that sample is sufficient to really kind of develop this thing? Do you think you talk with enough people to get a feel that that is in fact a problem? That's the first point. Can I answer that one first? I don't think the sample size is big enough to definitively say no, but the sample size is big enough and the, the folks that were giving the testimony in my judgment were credible enough to where it raised a significant red flag that if I was doing this on behalf of a corporate client, mm -hmm. that would have just made me launch into increasing that sample okay. size. And, and I've heard that. My, my second question is, did they give you any details with regard to what exactly the problem is between those two entities. So is it just the two entities or are there other entities involved? <clears throat> so in other words, when we say city and county, are we talking about, you know, there's several different community partners within our community. Is it community partners or is it just government or? Well, it says city, county and, and I guess buried therein is that we're talking about the governmental entities, but if you want to elaborate more. No, they, they, specific, they specifically in every single instance called out okay. turf war. I mean, I've heard the word turf war probably 10 times in four different interviews. And so I have no idea what that means because I'm not from here. I mean, I, intuitively I, I can make some assumptions of what that means, but um, it was something that was at least shared commonly with me to random for for sure. Well, we, we've got the mayor and the board chairman of the county board of commissioners here. I mean, I, I'd like to hear more about that. I think that is a, a recurring theme. It is critical according to what you said. And you have any suggestions as to how we should proceed in dealing with it? I think there's got to be some type of disconnect. Whenever, whenever we're going into communities speaking with employers, it's very evident those communities that everybody's on the same page. And when I say everybody, your your local government officials, whether it be city or county, your economic development organization, your your utilities, your education institutions, it's very evident that people are all working together, pulling in one direction. Okay. I didn't get that feeling. Yet. And so, and a lot of it was because of the testimony of the perceived lack of coordination. So, do I think our sample size was big enough for me to stand here and give you just definitive answers? I think this is what should be done, absolutely not. But I think having some type of level of cooperation from an economic development perspective, everybody pulling in the same direction is something that clearly has to happen now. Who are the parties that are involved in that? That's outside of the scope of what I can tell you here. I'd like to speak on behalf of the city, and I think uh, I think Bill will probably <clears throat> go along with me on this. Uh, he and I both have heard this over the years, and we've done, we, we feel like we've gone above and beyond trying to work together. Right. We have, he and I have lunch together occasionally, we discuss, we're on the phone. Part of, some part of the problem might not always be the government, but it could be individuals who are, could be. are trying to see to it that we don't get along in some cases. And, uh, and you know, I feel like that we're, we've made a lot of progress, and some of these people could be talking about past problems and everything, but uh, I know I, I, every time something comes up that involves the county, I think Bill and I can, uh, we usually come to some sort of agreement on it. Well, then here's one thing that I, I could suggest. So, while I, I agree with you, there's a very good chance that this could have been adequately addressed and the sample size was either small or just 
randomly skewed towards people who have negative experiences from the past. Then the follow-up question would, well, one thing I can assure you of is, had we talked to these individuals and had a real project, it would have been enough of concern to do follow-up due diligence on it. And so if I was doing follow-up due diligence, how would you adequately satisfy a prospect that? Well, don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we do have some disagreements. There's no question about that. It usually involves money. But, uh, <laughs> but that's a surprise. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I think the next I think the next year will really determine a lot of things with us locally because uh, we have House Bill 489 coming up. I hope I'm still around during that point, uh, during that particular time. Uh, but uh, we uh, we'll see how things go there. Well, I, if, if I might, I mean I, I agree with the mayor. I, you know, he and I both um, work extremely hard to try to overcome um, this perception of turf wars and the two local governments primarily being uh, going head to head all the time. We know, as you probably find in any community as you kind of touched on, we know that we're not going to agree with everything just simply because um, we, we do have a tendency to protect our own turf as you want to call it that. But at the same time, we know at the end of the day, what we want to do is, is make some of the best decisions that we can and work together for the benefit of this community. So I, I, I personally take exception to that. Now, I do know that it takes years to overcome that perception. Yeah. It, it's, like, it's like that proverbial first of reception that you get from folks. That hangs with you for a long, long time. And so we've been trying to overcome that, and we're go we'll continue to work on that. And that's one thing that I hope that this community will continue to work on are those perceptions as well, because we do have some things we have to overcome. But I would I, I would add that if there's anything there that somebody such as yourself that has had these conversations, that sometimes folks will say something to you that they may not say to the mayor and I. Right. And uh, if there's anything there, any of that information that can be shared as far as how some of this can be helped. <coughs> and improve, we certainly would be uh, all ears and be willing to listen. All right, yeah, and I've shared the transcripts of all, so you can, one of the things that I, we promise in the interviews is in a group setting like this, that the information is not for attribution, I'm calling out who said what, but we have provided, um, provided the transcripts. And, and one thing I want to note, I, I carefully worded all of this stuff and used perceived in everything, because by, by no means am I declaring that there's a lack of coordination. Just the people that I've spoke with perceive there to be. And sometimes that can be just as damaging. And you're right, the overcoming perception is not typically something that's overnight, done overnight. Um, and you very well may be coordinating better than any community for the last few years, but that perception still exists. And there's, you know, the good news with this is if it was going to impact the corporate site selection decision that was considering Valdosta, that's usually not going to be addressed until they're probably conducting on-site due diligence here. And so they're going to hear those things when they're here locally. But the good news is if they're here locally, you're also going to have the opportunity to meet with them. And that's going to be the... the, the the opportune time to kind of dispel some of that, putting together a unified front. I mean, like I said, I probably do between 50 and 60 site visits a year, and those communities that show the best are ones that have a unified front. All their political leadership gets along. Um, they're there to support economic development. You have representatives from the, from the local education institutions, the superintendents following you everywhere you go. Um, you can just see that level of cohesiveness. Now, we didn't do that for this particular exercise, and that cohesiveness could be here. If it's not, I would be really concerned, because I think that cohesiveness is how you would kind of get over some of these perceptions. John, I, you know, I, I think it's a pretty simple proposition for the leadership to get together, and surely we're not indicting either the mayor or the county commission. I'm sure that those folks weren't pointing fingers at those gentlemen. I think the real question is, Bureaucratically, that's that's where the problem lies. It's below Bill and John. I think there is some bureaucratic disconnect. Yeah, I mean that very well. 
did, did, were, were there any indications that that in fact may be what is at issue? No, but also remember the role of this exercise was not to dig deep into local political issues, right? I mean, well, no, it's I not mean, a political is, issue if it's bureaucratic. So I, I'm well, okay, maybe political issue isn't the right word, but we, we certainly dig didn't dig okay. too deep in that particular that's issue. Fair enough. So Josh, I heard you talk about the turf wars piece of it, but was there any indication or do you know how important it is to a prospect to sit, come into a community and see that all the entities, whether it's the utilities, the city, the county, the development authority, the chamber of commerce, whoever it is that has the involvement in the economic development process, how important is it for them all to be on the same page, knowing that where the community is going, moving forward with a, a, a plan? Incredibly important. Here's why. It's because most companies are on an accelerated timeline, and they want to choose a community that's going to be able to meet their timeline for the project and is going to have the least risk of project interruption. One of the things that I heard from the city and county that I'll share in one instance, one guy had an issue with some, in two instances, they had an issue with utilities, getting service. And it was a discrepancy between the city and the county. I didn't push that much on the issue, but that was one of the, that was one of the points of concern. If I had a client and they were sitting in an interview and said, wait, it took you how long to get water service? That's not it. I mean, there's too many communities in the southeast United States that don't have to, that companies don't have to deal with that. And so maybe is that an isolated incidence? It probably is. However, I can't stress to you how much stock, speaking to existing employers, how much how much impact that has in the site selection decision. It can almost single-handedly sway a project against any data you can show anybody. Is it fair? Probably not, but it's real. Um, and, and I'm just trying to add some clarity and color to some of these things that I've heard. Um, I want to make a couple of comments there. Uh, talk about the availability of talent, specifically mentioned the uh, engineer. Well, <clears throat> and that's one of the things that we as a community probably we need to do a better job because you as a consultant are site selection won't know uh, but there is talent in this community and you've got companies or businesses uh, that uh, my process was if I needed a talent I would want to hire somebody that was already working at it. Right. So I had no problem going to uh, taking what it take uh, uh, whatever it took to uh, acquire that talent. Right. And and part of that is doing that drives up the labor cost, and you mentioned that several times in the cost of labor, but that's not the worst thing in the world for a community. No, it should be your objective. Uh, because uh, your higher talented labor folk, they've got their own club. Engineers talk. I don't want to be in Valdosta because they don't pay enough. But if I'm willing to go to that company next door and pay his engineer more to come work for me, that drives his, that drives his wage up, but it also raises the level of the median income in, in, the, in the community. And right. it's not a thing of pride anymore to be the low-cost community. Right. Uh, there's too many downs, too many negative connotations associated with that. And, and too many companies are afraid to do that. Uh, I uh, work as a consultant, and when people tell me they have trouble with issues, first thing I ask, what are you paying? Right. And what is it called? What are you willing to pay to produce your product? What is your product worth? Uh, you've got to get out of that, be that, that service and industry mentality. Right. If you're talking about industry and manufacturing, you, you're talking about another level. And that, as a community, we as a community, that's the product we need to be selling. That we are the industrial community. We did a more than 
a super job of being one to attract the next restaurant, the next hotel, motel. And we got away from manufacturing. And that's what people are telling you when you go to the interviews. The few manufacturers that we have left, yeah, they're having a difficult time because you don't want a, a bus boy assembling your uh, transmission or and as a community. That is a message that, and you don't know that well, from a site selection standpoint, and you can't get that in a two hour tour. Maybe, maybe I didn't clarify that good enough because one of the things I think is an asset of this is I think there are a lot of semi-skilled manufacturing talent here. Your machinists, your maintenance mechanics, your there's not a lot of welders anywhere, but uh, just as good as any community for those types of production talent. The interviews supported that and all the data we looked at supported that. The output of Wiregrass supports that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. The thing that I don't agree with, that the data shows, the output of your institution show, and the testimony from employers show, is engineering talent. Now, is that really that big of a deal? If you're dead set on attracting advanced manufacturing operations, then it's a huge deal. If you're fine attracting a lot of other manufacturers that look the same, then it's really not that big of a deal. I think you've, you've got that talent here. If, and that's, that's when I started this off. One of the things I said is the, one of the biggest mistakes that we see communities make is going after the wrong targets. If you had a bucket full of money and said, I'm going to spend this money marketing and attracting corporate talent, or excuse me, uh, corporate investment, with the assets given today, I think if you spent one dollar attracting advanced manufacturing, you just wasted a dollar because you don't have the assets here to do that. Now, more your general production, sure. And you're right, the more you bring into that, it's just going to elevate the wage base. I agree with that wholeheartedly. <coughs> and that should be your objective. I guess what I'm trying to do is temper expectations, right? I mean, is it realistic that the next 100 person advanced manufacturing? where robots are making things and you've got an R&D facility and 75 engineers running all that's going to locate here? Probably not. That's, that's not too terribly realistic. Could it be realistic in the future? Depends on if you want it to be realistic. You'd have to develop programs at the, at the, at the college to support that. You'd have to start trying to recruit that type of talent. And that's, a, that's something that takes a long time to do. That's not an overnight fix. That's a 10-year that's a fix. But there's got to be more to do to close that gap than just Absolutely. get the Board of Regents to allow BSU to have an engineering degree. There's got to be more. I think it starts, and I, I don't know this, but one of the impressions I get, and if, if I were to spend a lot more time kind of getting in the weeds here, one of the things I want to vet out is the collaboration between your existing industry and BSU. I'm based on the programs that are offered at BSU. I'm not too terribly convinced there is a lot of collaboration. Last year, the, uh, the governor issued a considerable amount of money for STEM research upgrades to several universities. Every one of them were in the Atlanta area. None of them were south of, uh, I believe, Columbus did get some. But uh, that's one of the problems we have in getting recognition sometimes and receiving some right. money to yeah. develop some of those programs. Yeah, I mean, I understand that's a, a very real hurdle. I think that the conversation actually needs to start below BSU and below Wiregrass. Um, our high school levels, we're, we're going into an age with our CTAE programs where we're trying to have our high school graduates come out with certifications where they can start in workforces. So it shouldn't just start with Wiregrass and with DSU because sometimes that might be a little too late. 
we're, we're trying to move our educational system into the next generation to where we're producing high school graduates who are ready to maybe skip BSU and Wiregrass and start to go out into that industry already. So I think that conversation needs to start a little bit earlier than it does with Wiregrass and BSU. Yeah, I mean, communities that do workforce development well, the not only high school, middle school, high school, and their post-secondary institutions are well coordinated. And a lot of it isn't necessarily they're receiving the training at the high school level. It's that they're receiving the awareness at the high school okay. level. That's a big issue. And then you have, I don't even know if that's an issue here, but if you did have that issue, you have no monopoly on it. I mean, it's just tough getting kids interested in STEM and engineering because they don't understand the possibilities of it. And so if that is an issue here, it's, it's one that needs to be rectified because communities that do good workforce development, they have an awareness. And a lot of it starts with the existing companies. Another attribute of communities that do workforce development well, their existing industry is really, really, really involved with curriculum planning at not middle school, high school, and the colleges. They're taking kids on plant tours. They're sponsoring science fairs. They're doing all of these types of things. That might be happening here. I don't know. But I'm, I'm just telling you that's a characteristic. Um, but if if I were to dig in the weeds more to if a company an advanced manufacturing company was paying us to evaluate this for them as a real location that would be one of the things I want to dig into for sure well, I don't want to put uh, Dr. Holman on the spot but uh, you know Stan's program he has a STEM program at his middle school up at Pine Grove and uh, it was about going out asking the questions. And one of the questions he asked me was about the qualifying for the state program and about the governor had put the program upstate. I told him I didn't hear this, what the governor's doing. If you want to put the program in school, just say so. And did it not happen? We're in our third year at Pine Grove Middle School with becoming STEM certified. Uh, sixth grade computer apps and programming. Uh, seventh grade biosciences, we have a, a working hydroponics and aquaponics lab for the kids. And eighth grade is uh, robotics and engineering, uh, earning high school credit before they get there in those areas. Also math and science, also working with that, where the kids apply what they learn in math. So we're in the third year of that program at uh, Pine Grove to get state certified. Josh, quick question. So if they're doing that in middle school, when would that start affecting the data? Five to ten years. Yeah, I mean, yeah, here's so, the, so the data wouldn't start changing. I guess that's a. No. Here's the problem: is I think that is an asset. I really do think that's an asset. The problem is you're not going to have the opportunity to display that as an asset until far along in that site selection process. And where are we making it to the? Not for those types of projects. And so that's why I said, I mean, this is a long term. If if the community came together and said and came to a consensus on what the vision of the community is moving forward from a corporate attraction perspective, which I don't know if it has. It might or might not have not done that. But if it did come together <coughs> and they said, I want to go after advanced manufacturing, yes, the things that, that he's doing are incredibly important, but you're right, it's, it's a long-term, I mean, it's a long-term, long-term battle. So I guess like what, from, what I take away from this, it's like for those of me as manufacturing, we're not making it through the top of the funnel. How many advanced manufacturing prospects has come through? Yeah, um, yeah I, that's right. But I showed you why. Right. Okay. Based on your 10 or 12 um, select sites, um, hypothetically, where would you rate Valdosta and Lowndes County? Uh, for your perceived model? If we were doing just a general production project, it would have been, been very good. One of the best. I mean, I think, it, without question, one of the best. It really wasn't a weak link. I mean, you had the workforce availability, your cost structure, not just from a workforce perspective, just your overall cost of doing business here is low. Location is outstanding. I think it scored really well. Um, 
if you break projects, it, the higher degree of sophistication of talent you need, mainly from engineering type talent, PhD type talent, R&D type talent, that's when your competitiveness starts to fall sure. significantly. But I would say for general projects, well, very well. Very indicative of the industry that we saw here. Assuming that uh, as industry comes to you, they, they rank, it's just a weighted factor rating model. Uh, they give you the weights of what we're looking for, how much emphasis we're placing upon climate versus education versus whatever. You said at that point, and there was an article in the Wall Street Journal not too terribly long ago about this particular thing. Come, it, places like Valdosta or anywhere else, even Atlanta, don't even know they're in the running. Oh, right. Uh, what does the community need to do to change those factors, or change the scores on those factors, to get into the running? Well, identify the factors you need to change. I mean, that's step one. Well, first off, I don't... I can answer your question directly, but I'm not suggesting that answering that question directly is what I would do if, if I was the community. Because I think that's changing the factors that influence this phase right here are incredibly, well A, you're, there's a lot of guessing going on on what factors you need to be changing. B, it's incredibly expensive and takes a long time to do. So if the community wanted to pursue general manufacturing because uh, advanced manufacturing, ultimately that may be the goal, but right now as a, as a short term prospect, pursue general manufacturing, uh, what do we need to know, what, how do we know what is most important to those companies out there? I'll show you. Uh, If I, if I was doing economic development, I'm glad I'm not because I've never done economic development, but if, if I was doing economic development here, I think you're at a crossroads. I think it's, I think you're at a crossroads of, do I go all in on, you know, a very highly specialized sector like advanced manufacturing? Or do I find my competitive strengths and go all in on that and just build the, the industrial base? So the, the old bulk consulting SWOT analysis, what are we good at and chase that, and then what do we want to become? Yeah, so here's how, if companies are ranking, how they're choosing locations, it's right here. The middle one, manufacturing, so labor availability, logistics, business climate, real estate availability, labor costs, regulatory environment, utilities and infrastructure. I mean, and that's the average of probably the last 50 or so projects we've done. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that all of these measures need to be taken, or it's, it's wise to take all the measures to attract advanced manufacturing. I'm actually trying to remain objective and impartial, but I'm saying it's, it's if attracting high-end talent and growing the wage base substantially is an objective, I think it's probably more realistic to continue to attract general manufacturing. And with that, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a lot easier time doing that than something with an R&D component to it. And that's gonna raise your skill set and wage base to where you're, hopefully you'd be satisfied with it. I think you're gonna have a lot easier time and the, I mean, those those are very good paying jobs. Those eighteen to twenty five dollar an hour jobs. I mean, those are really good paying jobs. They're just not ninety thousand dollar a year engineering jobs. And that's what advanced manufacturing is. 
that, that's another topic we hadn't even talked about, is the definition of advanced manufacturing. Like, what is that? What do they do? What type of employees? You ask three people, you're going to get three different answers of what that is. Um, what I perceive it to be is, it has some type of R&D component, a lot of engineers, um, a lot of automated process, where basically I have engineers programming equipment that are doing the work. That's advanced manufacturing. And it just requires a talent base that I perceive they're not to be here right now. So if you were us, and we wanted to try to change things for the short term, what are the three things you would do? I would do one it, one thing that I think accomplishes a lot of things. One is make sure that your existing industry, your economic development platform, your community political leaders, and your education institutions are working in a collaborative fashion towards whatever economic development goal the community has. However, I'm not convinced that that overall economic development goal has been developed by the community. So like, it's hard for me to say go do this because I don't think everybody knows what they're pulling for together. And so if it were me and I hesitate to suggest this because I think that it's, it can be a very risky endeavor, but one that might be worth looking into here is to have some type of strategic plan to make sure everybody's on the same page and there's an implementation process that's documented. Can I ask <clears throat> two more questions? One, if the percent concerns the overall workforce availability metric, one, explain that, and two, the is there root cause or causes for difficulty in recruiting talent to Valdosta? I know you've been here two hours and it's hard to tell, tell them today. Well, the difficult recruiting talent, the only the only way to assess that is testimony for employers. There's nothing data-wise. You can go look at quality of life metrics, which this seems to be a very high, have a very high quality of life. And employers will even tell you that. Once I get people here, they love it, they stay. It's a great place to raise family, etc. That's an issue that a community like Valdosta doesn't have a monopoly over. I've spent considerable time in communities like Milledgeville, um, Dothan, I'm trying to think of other, that Dothan's in Alabama, excuse me, um, in like-sized communities, and they all have that problem, the whole recruitment, recruitment problem. As long as you have a high quality of life, which you do, I really wouldn't worry about that because I don't really think there's a whole lot you can do about it. Um, in the workforce availability metric, um, that was mainly that was mainly education attainment and age structure. A lot, a lot of this seems to be perceived budget or business advantages, perceived concerns. I keep hearing this perception term over and over and over again. As I'm a perceived, and don't want to back myself in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, perceived. That conflict between the city and, and, and the and the county, and, and I can you know I speak to parents all the time and uh, international students all the time, and what they're seeing when they get into to the media is all the difficulties, you know of oh all these murders that are occurring in Valdosta, but but we're still down here at the bottom, but but they see that in the newspapers all the time, or see these difficulties between the city and the and, and the county in the newspapers all the time. So to me, part of it is not only a strategic plan, but it's also going to be a huge marketing plan to change that to get the newspaper and other media sources to start to, the cooperation between these groups and the cooperation and, and all these things. So I think the perception, yes, they, the employers are seeing, seeing this because they read it in the newspapers. They read it all over the southern part. But what are we doing to change it? Is we're, we're not changing their perceptions. 
even though the, the fact that we may be doing it, that we don't have this difficulty they're saying we do, but it's not out there that we don't have this difficulty. Yeah, involving local industry, and I've said it three times, I think that's a huge portion of this. Collaboration between local industry and economic development and education. That's the only way to change corporate perception. And every single, anytime you see perceived, well, here, it's perceived from your local business. And, and a corporate attraction exercise, that's all that really matters. I mean, I, mean, I don't think people will be considering community or too terribly concerned about what's going on from a media perspective. Um, but yeah, getting getting your local existing industry on the same on the same uh, page. That's that's a, something I would definitely recommend. And look, we're nitpicking here. I mean, I showed you how competitive Valdosta is in the Southeast United States. I think this is a very competitive competitive community. And when we dr were driving around, I made the comment to Andrea how impressed I was with the industrial parks. And we drove through Valdosta State. I mean, we're we're. Nitpicking. I mean, I'm I'm trying to find the the worst of a very good situation. Um, yeah, I think I think our great takeaway here is that we we probably made two of the three funnels that you identified. You know, from the bird's eye view, you know, right. And so to get to the surface, then you get into some of these these issues, and, it, and you know, I kind of sensed here that instead of us patting our back, on, uh, patting ourselves on the back about the good things that you brought to us today, is that we immediately jumped on the bad things, and that's because. Really, there is a movement in our community to um, galvanize and move forward, right. um, addressing a lot of these concerns that you brought up. You, know, this, you did a competitive analysis, but it's basically turned into a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat analysis as well. That we'll probably kick another ball. You know, yeah. like, like you even suggested a um, um, a study you recommended, but some some kind of you know, yeah, somebody who specializes in strategic planning. yeah, strategic planning that does all that and and. Um, and, and I do think that we're not going to start now doing those things that we need to do, but it's already starting and um, the momentum is definitely going that way. And you have both parties that were kind of identified here. They could have not said anything, we should have just gone away, and, you know, but they both spoke up and said, right. hey, we're, we're involved here, we want to address these. And, and so that's just an example, um, I think. So um, the competitive analysis and overall takeaway for me today is that we're in a good spot from, from the surface. So we're not eliminating ourselves by, by data until people get here and then certain things can, can trigger, but that's a look at somebody in the eyeball kind of thing at that point and we've got to address that. So um, believe me, we will. If I can put this very informally, my big takeaway is, is don't go pull a bunch of money trying to attract advanced manufacturing. Spend some time with your local industry, making sure everybody's on the same page and telling the same story. And that's really it. I mean, those are really the two, the two big ticket items. Any other questions? So I guess in the projects that you said that we you know could look at as attracting in just general production, is there activity in that sector currently, or are there projects? Uh, more activity right now in American manufacturing than there's been since. In a long, long time. For the first time in 30 plus years, it's making goods in the United States is relatively cost competitive. And are they looking in the Southeast? Are they looking at, is it certain? What type of communities are they looking at? Yeah. I spend more time in, my Southeast, in the Southeast United States than anywhere else, by far. Um, the Southeast United States dominates the United States from a manufacturing perspective. Yeah. Just because of its low cost structures, no unions, access to ports, all that type of stuff. Um, the project, the projects that I'm suggesting you have competitive advantage are the ones that have the most activity right now. Um, by far and away, the most activity right now. The thing that is mind boggling to me a little bit is that more leads don't come to the state of Georgia. <laughs> I've, and I've worked at the state of Georgia at the time. So, so I if we, so if Valdosta, and I'm not saying that's something that you've done. So if Valdosta needs to go find those leads, where do we go to get them? Well, that's costly. <laughs> a community of this size, 
70% of your leads should probably come through the state. 20% should just probably find you by random luck, just like a couple industries did in 2008. And 10% should be direct effort of direct marketing. Because if you think about it, I bet 60% I bet of corporate projects have a consultant, 40% do it on their own. The 40% that do it on their own usually always go through state economic development and use state economic development almost as their site selected. Do you think that's the structure of Georgia's state department? Because it's because each state has a different organization structure. Yeah, but, but filtering projects through state economic development, that's pretty consistent across all, all states in the Southeast United States. Of the 60% that are consultant-led, I bet 70% I bet of consultants start at the state level. So I think 30% of the 60% are people like us who don't start at the state level. That's why I think that's that's why I think seventy percent of the needs for a community size should come to the state or George Powell. And then, and that, that's a whole topic for a yeah. different this a day. I mean and I could shed light on you know my theories of why that might be in a hypothesis, but that's a, that's completely we've gotten into enough politics today. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. And so um, thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions or feedback, yeah, and I'll be glad to give you my card if anybody has any questions at any point in time. And this uh, and this isn't an exercise. I told Andrew where I just come in, give a presentation, and tell you to go to bad, the bad, the ugly, and leave. I'm happy to help on an ongoing basis. The, tie up some of these loose ends, or if there are specific issues that need to be addressed or clarified, I'm certainly happy to do that as well. So I appreciate you having me.